The territory of Alaska, the land of the totem, the land where hundreds of square miles have yet to feel the tread of white man's feet, the land with a fabulous yet chaotic past, with a promising brilliant future, attracting all in whom the pioneer spirit still prevails. Alaska is the home of the Eskimo, whose ancestry is a matter of conjecture among anthropologists. They are a happy, healthy race who live in the western and northern sections, bordering on the Bering Sea and the Arctic Ocean. It is the land of the Kolosh Indians, who were fierce cannibalistic warriors less than a century ago, of the Aleuts, so named after the Aleutian Islands where many make their living. It is also the land of southeastern Alaska Indians. Today, Alaska is also the land of hard-working Americans, old and young, men and women, not afraid of work, and who are driven on by the dreams of fortunes which are there to be made. Theirs is a constant battle with nature, which without warning often sweeps in or closes down, causing irreparable damage or loss of time. Alaska is always thrilling, demanding, and usually getting the best in a man or woman. Chichacos, as newcomers are called, are first of all impressed by Alaska's towering mountains and her hundreds of massive glaciers. World-famous Mendenhall, a few miles out of Juneau, has held many a tourist spellbound. The ice cap all but smothers the rugged peaks, and the glaciers are outstretched fingers of this vast mass of ice which is constantly exerting tremendous pressure, surging over ridges and down mountain valleys. Magnificent 20,300-foot Mount McKinley, highest on the North American continent, and its sister, Mount Foraker, rise majestically from the Sitna Valley. You are looking at them from a distance of 160 miles. Glaciers, mountains, and beautiful flowers go hand in hand in Alaska. For three months a year, almost constant daylight brings about fantastic agricultural and, but in September, nature's fall magnificence borders the highways. Industrially, experts say only the salmon industry has been fully developed. Over a hundred large canneries dot the shore from Ketchikan to the mouth of the Yukon. In the Bristol Bay area, Conservation decrees the use of sailing boats and special meshes in the gill nets. Because of these steps, the annual pack from this area has been fairly constant. Controls are necessary because countless millions of salmon converge in a relatively small area to make their way up three or four rivers to spawn and die. Power fish scows such as the Duchess are only one of a great variety of craft utilized by Alaskan fishermen. These Karluk Indians on the island of Kodiak enthusiastically haul 13,000 salmon from their beach net into small boats for delivery to a nearby cannery. On sea, on land, all along the coasts of the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, the talk, the action, the life is salmon. Salmon are not the only fish in Alaskan waters. Halibut, Cod and herring abound and afford much employment during seasons. King crab, shrimp, scallops, and oysters are also coming into their own. But when all is said and done, the salmon is king, by far the largest industry in Alaska today. Gold and Alaska are synonymous to many, and gold mining is one of the major industries. The sight of such platinum and gold nuggets is enough to make anyone head for the territory, but nuggets of any size are very, very unusual. For years, the Yukon and Kuskokwim rivers were the sole transportation means to the vast interior. Some say aviation is and will be the making of Alaska. Certainly, aviation has opened Alaska, every section, and is playing a major role in its economic and social life. One measures distance not in miles, but in flying hours. The most aviation-minded people in the world, Alaskans are on the many scheduled and non-scheduled airlines for nearly every commodity, from pins and needles to household furnishings and tractor engines. Business or pleasure, 
In Alaska, one generally flies. Yes, Alaska is the land of aviation. Visitors, including tourists, are taking full advantage of the frequent daily services from Seattle and Minneapolis to various centers. Alaskan businessmen often commute to the states, transact their affairs, and in a matter of hours or a few days at most, they are home. Trips that a few years ago would have taken weeks, even months. Important to the economy and future of the territory. The nearest port to the states, Ketchikan, is a tourist mecca and the fishing and lumbering center of the territory. Ketchikan lives by the fruits of the sea. Rich in Indian as well as early pioneering history, it flourishes with the summer influx of visitors. And you can tell how the fishing season is progressing by the smiles or grim looks of its citizens. People of this southeastern center, like their brethren in any other part of the world, make hay with the signs, which uh, means a cruise ship is in, or a banner fishing season is in full swing. The construction of large pulp and paper mills in the immediate vicinity will mean year-round employment, the lack of which added drawback on Alaskan economy. The picturesque small boat harbor of Thomas Basin, with its nearby and ever-smoking lumber mill, is crowded with visiting craft. Contrary to common belief, totem poles are comparatively new. The Indians started carving them only 90 years ago. Generally carved out of spruce and colored by herb and berry stain, they tell the history of a family or commemorate a loved person. Exerting great patience and all right psychology, the Indian who was owed money carved this totem and set it up so that every time the debtor even looked out of his house, the finger was on him. Birds, animals, and fish denote by their position or action, triumph, despair, love, or death. Each little mark, even a variance in color, carries a meaning to those few who can read the story all totem poles proudly reveal. Ten miles from the city, along the channel to the north, and the entrance to the famed Inland Passage, the government has rebuilt many totem poles, following the originals to the minutest detail. In Community Park is an exact replica of the spot and surroundings, where only a few score years ago the Indians gathered for their tribal meetings. In this communal house, where the tribe would gather in the one big room, circling the sunken pit in which a fire blazed for heat and light. Heading north to Juneau, one can stop at the picturesque fishing towns of Wrangell and Petersburg. With a break in the weather, the miles of green forests and snow-clad mountains provide a lovely backdrop to the blue water that leaves you breathless. A floating fish trap is etched against the lucid water, and as there is a cannery tender nearing, let's stop for a moment and watch the brailing operations. Closing the lead so that the salmon can, the men make ready for the brailing net to drop into the swirling mass of fish. Within a few hours, these fish will be packed in cans, ready for market. Approaching Juneau from the west, the grandeur of Mendenhall Glacier and the peaks of the Three Sisters capture the attention of all. Actually a dead glacier, and receding at the approximate rate of 100 feet a year, Mendenhall rates among the world's most beautiful glaciers. Flying 50 feet above the glacier, you can see that a glacier is not white, as distance makes it appear. One can find all colors in them, and the pulverized rock gives it a dirty appearance. Nor are they smooth, far from it. These crevasses sometimes run as deep as four to 500 feet. East of Juneau, at the mouth of the Taku River, we look down on a tank ship heading into the channel. With modern homes and a mechanized industry, a never-ending supply of petroleum is required. Nestled at the base of 5,000-foot Mount Juneau, the capital city of the territory immediately captures the visitor with its compactness and metropolitan appearance. The home of the governor, 
who is a presidential appointee, the varied territorial legislative and executive agencies, as well as the headquarters of many governmental bureaus, Juno well acts its part as capital and social center. The Alaska Juno Gold Mine, once one of the world's largest producers, was responsible for the growth of the city. For years, its weekly payroll was the backbone of the city's economy. Proud of their modern hotel, the Baranoff, the natives also point with pride to their stores, which carry complete lines of the smartest and finest merchandise. At the annual Soapbox Derby, with the winner going to the Akron, Ohio National Soapbox Races, one begins to grasp the sincere, deep interest the Alaskan people have in their children. You see oldsters, whether they are the parents or not, teaching girls the sports and skills which build strong bodies and initiative, the ability to care for oneself under any circumstances. They know that resourcefulness pays off in business as well as in the wild. Away they go, crouched low in the cockpits to cut wind resistance. Whizzing around the bridge turns the racers into the final stretch, with the broadcasting car close behind. This is the payoff, and every young boy in Juno dreams of speeding first across the finish line, the champion soapbox racer of Alaska. The roar of planes is startling to the visitor. Scheduled airlines as well as private ships are constantly on the go. Aboard this twin-engine goose, we are heading for Sitka, 50 minutes southwest of Juneau. Known as New Archangel when it was the capital of Russian-held Alaska, Sitka today is principally a fishing port. It was here in 1867 that the initial transfer papers were passed between Russia and the United States, consummated a year later in the sale of Alaska for $7,200,000. At the time, this transaction was ridiculed and popularly called Seward's Folly after Secretary of State Seward. The annual salmon pack is over 20 times this amount. Any view of the seaport must show the modern pioneer's home where old-time sourdoughs can spin their yarn and relate deeds during their carefree fading days. Early Russian influence is very evident in Sitka where the old Russian Orthodox Church seemingly blocks the main street. Alexander Baranov, the Russian pioneer who opened Alaska to the world by his colonizing program, is said to have brought these church bells from his native land. In the distance, beyond the town, is world-renowned Mount Edgecombe, an extinct volcano, enhanced greatly by Indian sagas. Typical of the thousands of bays and coves of southeastern Alaska is Silver Bay, with its famous mountain and cross of snow. Climbing steadily since leaving Juneau, we level off at 11,000 feet and soar through the pass, around the Creon and Fairweather Mountains, on out along the Gulf of Alaska. From our vantage point, the layer of clouds below obliterates the greater part of the myriad of glaciers which seem to flow in all directions during the 600-mile flight to Cordova. On a clear day, this daily scheduled flight along the coastal range of mountains will long be remembered. Here, the Ice Age reigns supreme over an area too exposed for the camera. Queen of the range is the 18,000-foot Mount St. Elias, which towers over the world's largest glacier, Malaspina, larger in area than the state of Rhode Island. On the eastern tip of Prince William Sound, and but a few miles from the mouth of the Copper River, the life and business of Cordova swings with the good or bad fishing seasons. At one time, the seaport terminus for extensive copper operations, which are now deserted, this beautifully situated town is planning and working for new developments. Winging over Prince William Sound, we pass the much publicized Columbia Glacier, where cruise ships approach cautiously and let go with a blast of their horn, causing hundreds of tons of ice to drop from the face of the glacier into the water.
Taking full advantage of a small flat area at the foot of the Kenai Range is the town of Whittier, a seaport railroad terminal. From here, goods go by rail through a pass to Anchorage and further north to Fairbanks. Directly overhead, nature's might is ever present. Between Prince William Sound and the Cook Inlet, the Chugak Range juts spectacularly in all directions, as though disputing man's presence. It's a short pass, and soon you're nosing down over Turnagain Arm. The city of Anchorage lies below. Besides being Alaska's largest city, Anchorage is the headquarters of the government-operated Alaska Railroad, extending south to the seaports of Seward and Whittier, and north to the interior center of Fairbanks. Anchorage is the most aviation-minded city in the world, with more private planes per capita than any other. Scheduled airliners and bush pilots reach out to Kodiak, the Aleutians, Tokyo, and the Orient, all points in all directions. Every town has its favorite meeting place. In Anchorage, it's the Federal Building Steps. Transportation and supply by air, sea, railroad, and highway are the key factors of the city's growth. Starting here on 4th Avenue, you can drive north to Fairbanks or via several highways, including the Alaska Highway, to any city in Canada or the States. Prompt, competent medical attention is more than a requisite in this land of far away and Anchorage citizens are rightfully proud of their fine hospital and its modern equipment. Daily, the diesel-powered train for Fairbanks leaves headquarters depot, making the 500-mile trip in 13 hours, passing through the fertile Matanuska Valley and circling the base of Mount McKinley, affectionately known as Big Boy, on its way to the interior. Engine number one, and it means just that. A few short years ago, this would have been the engine pulling you into the city of Fairbanks. The mining town of Fairbanks is situated in the center of the broad and fertile Tanana Valley, a tributary of the Yukon, old as far as Alaskan cities go, and barely a hundred miles from the Arctic Circle. It is the starting point for Point Barrow, the northernmost tip of the American continent and now the center of naval petroleum explorations. You head west to Nome, or to trading posts along the Yukon and Kuskokwim rivers. Fairbanks is truly the jumping off place, and sourdoughs advise, from here on, brother, you're on your own. The Federal Building is a beehive of activity with the Army building immense airfields and depots in the area. Agriculture plays an important role in Alaskan economy. This experimental farm, operated in connection with the University of Alaska and owned by the government, has made many valuable contributions to agricultural developments in the area. Renowned for its mining, agriculture, and husbandry courses, the University of Alaska is located at College Town, near Fairbanks. The Esther Creek Goldfield utilizes giant dredges which float on the ponds which they create. An air view of the tailings gives one the impression he is looking at a mole's playground. 24 hours a day, day in and day out, from early spring to October, this endless chain of giant buckets holding 12 cubic feet each brings up pay dirt from as deep as 55 feet. Inside the dredge, the dirt passes through the intricate system of hydraulic washings with the gold captured in riffles and sluice boxes. A few miles north of Fairbanks is the site of the famous Tanana Valley discovery in 1902, which brought many to the territory seeking yellow fortunes. The big battle in gold mining in Alaska brings you face to face with nature and permanent frost. Since the richest deposits are in bedrock, it is necessary to thaw and wash or drag away the topsoil. Here the hydraulic operator will wash all the thawed dirt away down to the frost line, 
then switch to another sector while the sun thaws out the newly exposed ground. Any surface gold will fall to bottom because of its gravity and be picked up when the area is cleared and sluiced. This is a placer mining layout showing the inevitable bulldozer, power shovel, and movable sluice. With the bulldozer pushing the dirt within reach, the drag bucket digs in and carries the dirt up to the sluice box. Once in the sluice box, Oscar, the automatic hydraulic machine, washes all down toward the submerged ripples which catch the gold. The entire operation is based on the incontrovertible heavy density of the ore which will rapidly sink into the troughs or riffles crossing the sluice. The pressure of water is carefully gauged so that its force will be great enough to do the work, yet not too powerful to carry the pay metal down the length of the sluice. Yes, this innocuous pile of yellow mineral is gold, the ore that has often changed the history of the world, for gold and power go hand in hand. Leaving the city of Fairbanks, we head northwest over the mighty muddy Yukon, over hundreds of miles of tundra and wasteland. We cross the Arctic Circle, which is not visible, as some would have you believe, Arriving at Kotzebue, the trading post and Eskimo settlement on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. It is difficult to decide whether the airport to town conveyance is for the benefit of the arriving passengers or uh, for the pleasure of the native children. In bad weather, it is wise to wait for this unique method as the wet spongy tundra soon saps the strength of a walking man. Friendly, happy and healthy, You'll note all these traits in the Eskimos. They demand nothing, live on little, and really enjoy life. Hugging the shore of the Arctic Sea, whence they derive food and clothing from the seal and walrus, the Eskimo main street is actually the beach. In summer finery, two Eskimo mothers hurry with their children down main street. Note the covered papoose on the woman's back. Exceptionally young babies are seldom exposed to the bright sun. Eminent doctors claim that carrying a child in this fashion is the most natural way. With the Eskimos, it is necessary, for the woman does most of the work. It's not as easy as it looks, yet an Eskimo boy soon learns to handle a kayak with astounding skill. A visitor to the mainland is this chief of the little Diomede Eskimos standing beside the walrus-covered Umiak. His homeland is only a few miles from the Russian-held land. The Eskimo storehouse is the drying rack which one sees and smells everywhere. The salmon are for the dogs. The inviting piece of meat is a choice walrus roast. This is Nome, the scene of the mad gold rush at the turn of the century, where fortunes were made at day in gold-laden fields, only to be lost at night over gaming tables. Along the beach, a walrus skin is drying. More than likely, it soon cover the driftwood frame of an Eskimo's umiak. Placid now, near tidal waves have several times pounded the open beach smashing, destroying everything. Well, anyone can have a car on the Kugarak Railroad. They simply have to build one. Then, you help maintain the 88 miles of track, which lead to numerous mining operations and the famous Pilgrim River, the haunt of the Arctic trout. Annually, the King Island Eskimos move bed and board from their island home a hundred miles out in the Bering Sea to a spot on the beach a mile east of Nome. 
Here they set up their summer homes and exhibit their remarkable skill in ivory and fossil carving, drilling, scraping, polishing, resulting sometimes in exquisite carved cribbage boards out of walrus tusks. They work under their umiaks, displaying their handiwork for sale to tourists and residents. A young Eskimo mother proudly displays her child to her mother and grandmother. The three streaks on grandma's chin signify, according to ancient custom, that as a young girl she carried a healthy dowry for her husband. This old timer actually smoked matches for his tiny brass pipe held only a few crumbs of tobacco. With a frame of driftwood covered with specially prepared walrus hides, the Umiak has been known to sail through storms that have scattered modern design craft. The Eskimo thinks nothing of traveling 500 to 1,000 miles on the Bering Sea and Arctic Ocean. Allowing the sea to do most of the lifting and pulling, the Eskimos are very careful in launching their Umiaks, lest they shape bottom. In other words, then await the next wave. Continuing south from Nome, we reach the trading center of Bethel, transportation terminal on the Kuskokwim River. Here we find a large government-operated hospital, which dominates the flat tundra. It is generally filled with Eskimos from the west and some interior Indians. Natives within a radius of 200 miles trade at Bethel brings in exchange for food and fuel. There are many mining developments to the east and south in the hills that rise out of the tundra and most of the equipment and supplies are brought through Bethel. No birthplace of weather, a powerful CAA station is constant, sending out reports to airmen and weather stations all over the world. With stores all over the interior and western Alaska, the Northern Commercial Company plays a big role in the economy of the locality. Here's one enterprising native who snapped his fingers at the high cost of lumber and he used discarded petroleum cans. Every day there is to parade in Bethel. Instead of hats, it's, um, how do you like my fancy parka? While demonstrating the technique of throwing the harpoon, this Eskimo and his brethren actually hunt the seal, walrus, sea otter, and sea lion today with the latest powerful rifles. Say, has anyone ever seen a grouchier, sullen Eskimo? We certainly haven't. In fact, Smiling Joe had everyone in the area holding their sides with laughter. Somber and serious would describe this healthy Eskimo family and recall to mind other family portraits with a similar atmosphere. A turn around, girls. That's right. Introducing folks, the bells of Nunapichuk. Throughout the territory, the cache is the storehouse. Set up from the ground to allow air circulation, it primarily protects material and supplies from dogs, wolves, and other animals. This looks like a pan of pretty colored sand. Actually, it is $65,000 worth of platinum. At Naknek, the seaplane pond is the center of all activity, shuttling fishermen to the various canneries from the airport. During the month's open salmon season, a score of canneries on Bristol Bay frenziedly packed the famous red or sockeye salmon. In good weather, Bristol Bay is a picturesque spot with hundreds of sailing gill net boats searching and fishing for salmon. Power scows hover nearby like a mother hen and her chicks, waiting to take on boatloads of fish and rush them to the cannery for packing. The fishermen are paid so much per fish so they are counted by a tally man during the unloading. Bad weather is the rule, and it calls for all the endurance and strength in a man. A net full of fish is heavy, a running sea unruly. Yet, 
somehow the fish must be pulled in. Across the Aleutian mainland is the island of Kodiak, where fishing is the principal industry. Steeped in the history of early Russian occupation is the town of Kodiak. Fourth of July brings out the Navy Band, which leads the parade of floats and costumed youngsters. Like any other small American town, the old and young gather from all over the island to celebrate the birth of independence. Now there's the winning float from a nearby mission of Indian children. And this young Afognak lass is either seriously cogitating her day's program or trying to stare away the cameraman. And then there are the races for tots to grown-ups with prizes for all and, of course, hot dogs and ice cream. Valdez, beautifully nestled amid mountains and glaciers, has retained much of its early adventurous atmosphere. Its main street resembles a movie lot backdrop. When stopping at the famous Golden North, you find yourself looking for bearded sourdoughs with their heavy pokes of gold. As the seaport terminal of the highways to Fairbanks and Alaska Highway, Valdez handled considerable tonnage during the five-month ice-free season. A few miles out of the town, you can look up the valley toward Keystone Canyon. A white cloud, a red bridge with a green background, truly a setting for an artist. The highways in Alaska allow comfortable riding, the constantly changing views soon use up all descriptive adjectives and exclamations. One at you're riding straight for a mountain or glacier, the next you snake alongside a tumbling glacial stream. Road construction crews have a town of their own in an unbelievably beautiful setting, for Mount Brian stop for meals and overnight at road houses, such as this one in Eureka. In remote interior sections, sled dogs play very important roles, for often they are the only means of transportation during the winter. When well treated, the Malamute and Mackenzie respond in like manner. Chaining is necessary, as if allowed to run free, they would soon kill each other. Three quarters of an hour flight from Anchorage, and you're over the unique Lake George area where the ever-moving glacier blocks a stream forming a lake. Yes, Alaska is the land of the future. There are challenging, serious problems to be sure. Much pioneering and developing need be accomplished. Alaska will always issue a challenge to those with the pioneering spirit, an amazing, thrilling challenge in the land where a spade is a spade and a man is immediately accepted as a friend and fellow worker until he proves otherwise. You're down to earth in Alaska, where frills take time, and time is precious. You're one of a hard-working group of Americans in Alaska, the land where you're constantly up against the seemingly overwhelming forces of nature, where at the end of day's work, man and woman are tired, dead tired, but filled with the happy knowledge of building and creating. Just as the Indians patiently carve their intricate totem poles, hard-working Americans today are carving the land of the future out of this territorial Alaska. This was a Standard Oil Company of California presentation.